Amen. All the time, our God, hallelujah, is good in spite of circumstances or what is going on. That does not change that he is a good God here tonight. Amen. Welcome to the First Apostolic Church uh, this evening. Uh, we believe in repentance uh, for the remission of sins and baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We teach and preach what the apostles taught. Hallelujah. And we're glad to be in the house of the Lord here this evening that you have joined us uh, in our live feed. Uh, before we go to the Lord in prayer this evening, there are a few different announcements along the way here tonight. I want to share with you, uh, firstly, the Indiana District Apostolic Crusaders are continuing with their online uh, revival uh, nightly at uh, that's 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, but that's continuing nightly uh, on all nights except for Sundays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And so you can find that at the Indiana District Apostolic Crusaders Facebook page. I know that we have been sharing uh, nightly whenever they are having their online service, that on our personal Facebook page here at the First Apostolic Church. And so that's something that you can uh, be a part of or young people uh, can be a part of. Uh, during this time of quarantine. We want to go to the Lord in prayer here this evening. I got some of these standing requests. There's a few others uh, uh, that are added to this tonight. We need to remember, I want to continue to remember, I haven't yet uh, got any update concerning Grace's aunt, Nadine Rodriguez, but let's continue to remember her with this COVID-19. Uh, also, let's remember uh, Sister Sarah Voskis, uh, Pastor Jonathan Voskis's wife, she has COVID-19 as well. And so let's remember her. Brother Voskis is our uh, assistant 
superintendent of the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, one of them there of the southern region. So let's remember his family, his wife. Also, let's remember the family of Brother Guevara, uh, which was a missionary to Spain. Uh, Brother Guevara passed away with COVID-19. So when you remember his wife and family and the work over there, amen, that the Lord would help strengthen them, that family and that church family uh, during this time. Also continue to remember the Perkins family tonight. We need to remember Sister Brenda Trout's mother, Carol, Krista Trout's father. We need to remember him. We need to remember Sister Whitney, Sister Samantha Whitney's dad, Brian, also, uh, Let's remember uh, Xavier tonight uh, in a situation there that we're just going to pray about. Um, Let's also continue to remember our health workers across the land that are diligently given of themselves. And uh, also let's remember Brother Terry. Uh, They did have their appointment uh, on Monday in Louisville and uh, got some, some answers and some direction. Uh, but he still needs some prayer leading into this time of, of operation and correcting, uh, hopefully, what, what, what is going on in his body and back. So let's continue to remember, continue to remember him. If you have a need tonight in your home that uh, we haven't had an opportunity to see yet, you can take that to the Lord in prayer. Amen. He doesn't just hear the prayer of a pastor or the prayer of somebody that's standing in a church building. But regardless of where we may be, if we cry to the Lord, the Lord will hear. The Lord will hear our cry. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening. Father, I come to you tonight. I pray, oh God, the power of your spirit. God, move in each of these, oh Lord Jesus, request this evening. God, we pray, Lord God, for those that are working diligently, God, with those, God, that have COVID-19 and our Lord Jesus. God, affected by it. We pray, God, for those names that we have up on our list, people that are impacted by it. Lord, Sister Sarah Vasquez, we pray, oh God, you touch her body. Nadine Rodriguez, Lord, that body, Lord Jesus, tonight. Lord, we pray, oh Lord Jesus, for the loss of a loved one from it. God, those, Lord, missionaries to Spain, Lord, of the Guevara family. I pray, oh Lord, today and church family at that. I pray, God, every hour we need Thee. And I pray, O Lord, they need You, Lord Jesus, in this hour of their lives. I pray, O God, the names that I have mentioned, Lord, in Your hearing this evening. God, families, the Lord, fathers, the Lord. God, people of this church who has fathers, the Lord, and mothers. God, that it's in need of healing or in need of strength. We pray, O God, tonight, move up on Brother Terry McGee, Lord. You know, Lord, the robe that is ahead of him. You know the severity and the seriousness, O Lord Jesus, of these things, O Lord. And we, Lord, pledge this matter, God, unto you. You're a great God. You're a wonderful God. I pray, O Lord, today, Jesus, you supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. We know, God, that you own a cattle on a thousand hills. We pray, O Lord, today. God, you have unfathomable riches and unfathomable, Lord, ability. I pray, oh, Lord, tonight, God, we stand in need. We are a needy people. God, we stand in need, Lord, of your power, of your presence, Lord, of your healing, your deliverance. I pray, oh, God, every hour we need you, Lord God. Jesus, dispatch, Lord, ministering spirits, God, to those in need of them tonight. Lord, strengthen the weak and the weary, I pray. Oh, Lord, encourage the discouraged, Lord, I pray this evening. God, let your everlasting arms, Lord, enwrap somebody tonight, God, that's battling fear and anxiety and worry, Lord, I pray. Hallelujah, Jesus, God. You are the answer, Lord. You are the answer, Lord. And we give you all the glory and the honor in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's worship Him this evening. Shall we? Can we lift up hands, lift up voices? You know the songs, you sing along with them. Hallelujah. We have a great and wonderful God that loves to hear the praises of His people. I love you. God is so good to me. He is so good. to 
Sometimes the clouds hang low And I'd like to see them go Can I ask this question, Lord? Why so much pain? But he knows what's best for me Hallelujah. It's wonderful to consider the goodness of God and everything that our country has been going through. It's just good to consider the goodness of God. Amen. And his goodness toward his people. I know it doesn't always feel perhaps that way. Job said, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not evil? Amen. But he's a good God nonetheless. He is. Amen. Tonight, before we provide an opportunity, a space of time for you to prepare an offering digitally or perhaps needing to get an envelope and put the church address, P.O. Box 326, Mount Carmel, Illinois, on it uh, in order to mail in your giving. Uh, I want to also, uh, for announcement purposes here this evening, not only is there stuff taking place with uh, the Indiana District, Apostolic Crusaders, but the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ National Apostolic Crusaders Department has things going on as well. There's a bunch going on. I, uh, the best that I could tell you is go visit their Facebook page and you can see all the things there. There's broadcasts that's happening each Friday night uh, for the rest of the month of April and on through May as well. There's going to be sessions coming up as well on certain days for uh, missions and, and students with Pastor Matthew Ball and Missions America with Pastor Matt Perdue and how to use your gifts in the kingdom with uh, Brother Wes Comer and music and writing with Chad and, and uh, Fallon Erickson. So all kinds of stuff that's out there. There's even opportunities to uh, be trained on how to teach a Bible study, the Apostolic uh, Crusaders Bible study. And there's a PD PDF out there that's available for download and all kinds of things that they are putting together that you can just swim in. 
just all kinds of things. And so uh, you need to go visit the Apostolic Crusaders, the National Apostolic Crusaders Facebook page. Uh, all those items certainly can be found there. The Bible says in Proverbs 3 and 9, in thinking of offering and giving tonight, it says, Honor the Lord uh, with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Hallelujah. The Lord has provided increase in your life, increase into your family. He says, honor the Lord with those first fruits of that increase. And so we are going to give unto the Lord here this evening as he has so bountifully blessed us and enabled us. Thank God for health and wealth. Amen. That he's bestowed in our lives. You have this opportunity now to give again. It is an act of worship. Amen. That we surrender. Amen. Unto the Lord. You can give tonight digitally or again. Uh, by giving to our post office box. Amen. Take an opportunity right now. Amen. If you're not giving literally, amen, in some measure, go on and raise praise and worship the Lord. Amen. For what he has done for you during this time. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for giving unto the Lord. We appreciate that. God, no doubt, amen, sees that and takes good records and appreciates that as well. Uh, also, just my last announcement here uh, for this evening, this week, uh, Friday and Saturday, is the Prison of the Mind Conference uh, that's kind of being held and hosted by the Princess Within uh, conference format. Uh, but that will be Friday night and throughout the day on Saturday. Got several speakers and singers and testimonies and signers. Prison of the mind. Uh, if you know somebody that that may benefit, you may uh, share that. Uh, Prison of the mind conference on your Facebook page. And perhaps they will see it or invite them uh, to that. That will be a wonderful thing. We have uh, been in some meetings and still have some others to come uh, leading up to this. Making sure everything is in order. And uh, so it's going to be a good, good time uh, online. So there's several things, again, that you can get your feet uh, wet in concerning online conferences and services and devotions and whew, mercy, all kinds of things. We're going to be turning to the book of John, the gospel of John, the fourth gospel. Last week, we started a series on the gospel of John. We want to continue uh, that tonight, we're going to go to John chapter number one, start reading with verse number four. Amen. I'm going to ask my in-house people, please give me a timer here this evening, if you don't mind. That helps me kind of keep track of where I'm at. If I don't have one, I don't know where I'm at. Sometimes I move fast or sometimes I move slow. I want to just be moving just right. Amen. John chapter number one, verse number four. The Bible says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We'll come to find out that's John the Baptist that's speaking of here. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. For a little while tonight, I want to teach uh, us here this evening, titled this lesson simply this, The Word 
life and light. The word, life and light. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer right now that God would help us in the next several minutes as we look again at the word of the Lord. Father, I love you. I need you, Jesus, tonight, God. Lord, do what you do best, God. And you're able, Lord, to bring, Lord, understanding. You're able to bring enlightenment, Lord Jesus, to your word. Speak and minister, Lord God, through these lips of clay. I pray, God, for adequate words. God, I pray, Lord, this evening to be able to convey, God, the word of God, Lord Jesus, into the homes and the families of those, God, that are listening here today and will not fail to praise you and thank you for it. In the lovely name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. I'm, I'm really hoping that I'm not getting a habit started here that's going to follow me once all of this is said and done. Everybody's back in here and having a habit here of kind of just looking up and staring at the back double doors uh, in teaching and preaching. And so if, when we all get back in here and you're sitting in your pew and you see me staring a hole through the back double doors, just attribute it to this time that we've been in here for the past several weeks. The word, life and light. The Bible says in verse 4, in him, and again, to understand who the him is, go back to the previous verses. We started out talking about in the beginning was the word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so the in Him was life. Of course, that in Him is meaning the Word. That life was, according to the Word of the Lord, the light of men. It is within this fourth gospel, or the gospel of John, that uh, he unloads on us in the first chapter some terms that we are going to see pop up over and over again numerous times throughout this particular gospel. A couple of those concepts that he dumps on us here in verse number four is that of light and that of life. Uh, within this fourth gospel, the concepts of life are mentioned about 36 times throughout the gospel of John. And the concept of light about 21 times are touched upon and they are touched upon over and over again. We come to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, which uh, John the Beloved, or John, is also uh, responsible in authoring. And it's a little bit uncanny whenever you look at the Scripture because he states here that which was from the beginning. He's speaking about this word again, that which was from the beginning, this Jesus Christ, which we have heard, which... We have seen, because that word was made flesh, according to John, with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Verse 2, for the life was manifested, and it was when it became flesh. And we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that, and this is important, that eternal life. John says the life was manifested, but it was not just life, but it was an eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. And so we understand about the manifestation of the word uh, through the man, Jesus Christ, that word becoming flesh as stated in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse number 14. But again, it's amazing because John throughout the Gospel uh, tells us and ties that when we believe on Jesus Christ, and there's different ways that he says it, believe on Jesus Christ, believe upon, believe in Jesus Christ, that when we do this, that uh, upon Jesus Christ, it's not that there is just simply life that is connected to that belief, but there is eternal life that is connected to that belief. If you will, I just got a few verses of Scripture here from John. They won't be on your screen, but uh, just for your consideration, of John tying together the belief and this life, more so uh, indicated eternal life. John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. The famed John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Again, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life life. John 3, excuse me, John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not, I'm laughing at myself because it sounded weird just there for a moment, 
and have everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there is the time again of belief and everlasting life, not believing and you shall not see life, but rather the wrath of God. John six forty seven, another verse, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And so John repetitively throughout the gospel, and these are just a few examples. There are several more. Uh, is tying uh, our belief with not just life, but everlasting life. And so it's important, I think, here from the very onset, because remember, this belief aspect is all a part of John's pur- purpose uh, or the gospel of John's purpose. And that is he wants people to believe that Jesus is the son of God and that believing in him, that they would have life through his name. And so the believing that John all times speaks of in the scripture is not just a faith. It's not just a faith, a believing with with our, our, our mind or some type of intellectual uh, belief. It's not just faith, but it also has in that belief there is a trust that we trust in the Lord, that there is a committal that we are committing to God. For that matter, according to Thayer's lexicon, uh, this believing that John repetitively talks about throughout the gospel, it is a belief that is, according to Thayer's lexicon, it is a belief that is conjoined with obedience to Christ. And I think that's absolutely important because if you believe in the Son of God, you have everlasting life. It's just not an operation of faith, but it's a faith that is tied and conjoined to obedience, amen, to the one in whom we are believing. Not only do we see then the word, whenever I speak tonight, whenever I say life, and when I say light, when I say the word, when I say Jesus Christ, all those things are exactly the same. Uh, they, they are all uh, identifying, if you will, as one and the other. And so when we read in verse number three of John one, that not only was the word or Jesus Christ tied to uh, created life, uh, the sun and the moon and the stars, darkness and light, uh, the different accounts of the days as we have in the book of Genesis, because all things were made by him. But it is also tied to eternal life, which is uh, seemingly beyond us, it would seem beyond this present world. The Bible says in John 11, in verse number 25, uh, this is Jesus speaking to Mary about her deceased brother Lazarus. And the Bible says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Mary was, was downtrodden. Her heart uh, was sorrowful because her brother Lazarus had died. She basically told the Lord, had you been here sooner, this would not have happened. Jesus says, he'll live again. She says, I know that he will live, you know, in that day of the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so Jesus is the tie, if you will, to the eternal life that is beyond the here and now, beyond the life that we are presently living. Uh, he is the eternal life that is beyond death, that is beyond the grave. Jesus, he even spoke of himself on more than one occasion of being the bread of life in the gospel of John. He speaks metaphorically of himself being the bread of life. And in the, in the moment that he spoke to the disciples and the multitudes that he was the bread of life that came down from heaven and he was speaking in metaphorical terms, he also then in those moments emphasized to them that we, his disciples, those multitudes, they needed to ingest him. Now again, he's speaking metaphorically of being the bread of life. That they, they needed to ingest him because if they didn't, that they would have no life, no eternal life with him. The Bible says in John 6 concerning one of the bread of life discourses, John 6 and verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, Ye have no life in you. Verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last 
day. And so here in the Gospel of John, John wants us to understand as he as he includes this discourse of Jesus being the bread of life. He wants us to understand that we must have Christ in us in order to have eternal life. The metaphor was for the bread of life. You eat it, you, you drink of the blood, you eat of the flesh, and you'll have eternal life. And so in a sense for the spiritual aspect of mankind as Christians, we need to have Christ in us in order to have eternal life. Just as much as a, a literal hunger and a literal thirst must be appeased by eating and by drinking in order to sustain life on this real earth. John and Jesus was conveying to you and I that we likewise must hunger and thirst for him and consume in certain terms him in order to have eternal life that's beyond the life that we are living right now or as in another place of the scripture where he said that he would give us life and life more uh Abundantly, amen, eternal life, if you will. And so all of this that we've talked about this far, again, it ties totally to the purpose of this gospel. John is purposely wanting people to believe Jesus is the Son of God. He wants people to believe that they might have life through that name. Because the fact of the reality is this, a Christless life is not eternal life. And a Christless man or men, as the scripture goes on, is men with no light. With no light. The Bible goes on and tells us and begins to speak then about the light. Because in him was life and that light was the light of men. Now, this is a very simple principle uh, to wrap our minds around tonight. Don't get your hip waders out. It's not going to be deep. Don't worry about treading water here. But here it is. When there is no light, are you ready for this? There is darkness. Whew. That's powerful, isn't it? When there is no light, there is darkness. But darkness is not the opposite of light. Darkness is the absence of light. And if the life slash light is the word, and it is, according here to the first chapter of John, then a dark world or even a dark person is one that in reality is absent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Absent of that word, that life, that light this next verse that I'll share with you here this evening comes after a story told in the Gospel of John of a lady who was caught, the Bible says, in the very act of adultery. Jesus had asked her if any man had condemned her. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus' words to her was this, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Now, on the heels of that phrase of go and sin no more comes this verse. John chapter number 8 and verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. I think it's important that we define the word walk here in the Greek. The word walk in the Greek here means to tread all around, to be occupied with. In other words, he's saying he that follows me shall not tread all around in the darkness or be occupied with darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, Jesus is addressing those that stood there. Those that stood there concerning bringing this woman in the very act of adultery, we read that there were the scribes and there were the Pharisees that stood there, and none of them that stood there were without sin. Jesus even said to those men after they brought up that Moses in the law says that a lady that had done such a thing should be stoned, and no doubt, maybe, perhaps, I don't know, they already had clutched within their fists some stones, but Jesus said, those of you that are without sin cast the first stone at her, and they all departed from the eldest to the youngest. And so there was none that stood there that was without sin. And we understand today that we all have sinned. David, the psalmist, said that we were shapened 
in iniquity and that in sin our mother con- conceived us. But there is a difference in being born into sin and having had sin, but to keep sinning. To keep sinning is to walk in darkness. To keep sinning is to tread all around, to be occupied, if you will, with darkness. And to do that, to keep sinning and to walk in darkness, then is a good indication that we are not following him. We're not following him. Or even better yet, I'll go a step further using the terminology that John likes to use a lot in Scripture concerning belief. Not only are we not following him, but we're not even believing in him coupled with that obedience. The Bible says this, John 12 and verse 46. Jesus says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not, look here, important word, should not abide in darkness whosoever believeth on me should not abide again important to define the word because here's the fact of the matter folks it's one thing to make a mistake it's one thing to trip up and fall and have a moment of weakness and yield to temptation it's one thing to do all that but it's entirely another thing to abide in darkness or if you will defined to stay or to dwell or to remain or to tarry in darkness. Amen. God has no problems. Amen. With times of your weakness that you make a mistake, but there is a whole nother, uh, 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 if you will, ball field, purposely walking in darkness, treading all around in darkness. If you will, keeping your little pet sins close to you and in a closet and getting them out whenever you know it's safe to get them out. No, 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 no. If we abide in that type of darkness and walk in that type of darkness, hallelujah, then we're evidently not abiding in the Lord. Amen because the darkness and the light they do not, and we'll look at this a little closer later, they do not comprehend one another. The darkness rather doesn't comprehend the light more so as stated clearly in the scripture. And so this light, this life, this word, this Jesus Christ that we're speaking about tonight, again, the scripture says that this light shined in the darkness, but darkness comprehended it not. This is both true in the natural world and in the spirit world. In the very beginning of the book of Genesis, whenever God said, let there be light, that darkness then did not comprehend the light. And the Lord separated the light, the Bible says, from the darkness in the very beginning. But it's also true that the darkness doesn't comprehend the light when we talk about the spirit world as seen here in the gospel of John. If I can, I don't want to overburden you with terms, but I think it's important to define the word comprehend here in the scripture of verse number five. Comprehend means to lay hold of, to overcome, to gain control over. And so what we can glean from this very easily tonight is that one, a person will not be overcome By darkness, darkness will not gain control of a person if one is walking in the light because darkness does not comprehend the light. Darkness does not lay hold of the light. So a good way to keep from being overcome by the darkness is to walk in the light. Amen. As a matter of fact, the scripture even tells us that we should walk in the light lest darkness come upon you. He said, unless you want darkness to come upon you, then, then walk in the light because that is, a good, that is a good protection. That is a good, if you will, uh, means of keeping darkness from coming upon you is by walking in the light. And Christ is that light. For that matter, consider with me, if you will, we see in other places in the scripture, the apostle Paul even spoke of it. He said, even what, what communion? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? For that matter, he told us in 1 John, he said, if you walk in the light as he is the light, then you'll have fellowship one with another. Amen. You'll have fellowship with the Lord if you walk in the light as he is the light. But if you walk in darkness, you're going to have fellowship with something else besides light. 
and with other things, amen, that, that uh, are, are denoted as dark things, evil things. And we'll look at this just a little bit later. Things that are contrary, if you will, to the light. Amen. And so if we want fellowship with the Lord, walk in the light. If you want to keep darkness from overcoming you, walk in the light. Amen. Obey. Amen. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Other definitions of the word comprehend is this. It also means to realize or to understand. In other words, also conveyed in the scripture, not only does the darkness not overcome the light, but the darkness does not realize or understand the light. Folks, this is very true in the fourth gospel here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord Jesus Christ was the light of men, which he was, if he was the light of men, look at his own life concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In many regards, he was greatly misunderstood. He was greatly misunderstood in his earthly ministry. He was greatly misunderstood in the years that he spent here upon the earth. That misunderstanding reaches its climax at Calvary. They take him to a cross, they hang him high, stretch him wide. They were not understanding the light that had come to them. They were not realizing the light that had come unto them. Because the scripture tells us plainly, if they understood all these things, they never would have crucified him. If they, they, they totally comprehended him for who he was, they would not have crucified him. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse number 7, these words. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Here's part of the wisdom of God. Part of the wisdom of God is the manifestation of Jesus Christ, amen, during the days of the New Testament Scripture. That was a mystery that was held as a thought and plan in the mind of God from the very beginning of time, ordained before the world, amen, but for our glory and our purpose, verse number 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. Here it is. They didn't realize it. They didn't understand it, amen, for had they known it, had they known the wisdom of God intertwined in that mystery, that man, Christ Jesus, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. And so, again, in the natural world, in the spirit world, darkness does not comprehend the light. But it goes a step further, I believe, for us today and even for the church that this darkness and this light type of situation isn't only that darkness does not realize or that darkness does not understand the light, but also this. People, hear me clearly, people in darkness and loving darkness, this is your word and we'll look at it, don't want anything to do with the light. People that love darkness don't want anything to do with the light. God is light, the scripture here says, and in him is no darkness at all. All. So see, here is something important for us to digest tonight in our minds. It's hard to love darkness and be in fellowship with God. Because the light has a no darkness clause. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The light has a no darkness clause. Does that mean, Pastor McGee, that we're perfect? Absolutely not. No. But it does mean that as we live, we're endeavoring to follow him and stay committed to him mm -hmm. and believing in him. That we're just not, as other scriptures have already alluded to concerning the walk and the biting, we're just not treading around in darkness, trying to occupy ourselves with it, tearing there, remaining there. Right there, there, there. We are, we are endeavoring to follow Him and be empowered by the Spirit that we receive that will help aid us in our walk. From what would the apostle say? He has brought me out of darkness into this light. He set our feet on a street which is called straight. He's established our goings. Amen. And so the Lord will, if you will, uh, yield to Him and allow Him, Amen, to do so in our life. And so the Bible says, look at it now, John 3, verse 19, speaking of these people that uh, love darkness, they don't want anything to do with the light. The Bible says this is the condemnation or this is the judgment that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. 
They love darkness because their deeds are evil. There's, there's starting to be association then with the darkness. That it, it, it is the, 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 the abiding place of those with evil deeds. All right. Their deeds were evil. Verse number 20. For everyone that doeth evil, look, hateth the light. Neither come to the light. Lest, look now, why? Lest his deeds should be reproved. Lest his deeds should be reproved. So where darkness does not comprehend or realize or understand, light does understand light does realize light does comprehend and so we have these evil deeds that are associated with darkness so it's very apparent then that if you love darkness you're going to hate the light and likewise if you love the light you ought to have a a distaste for darkness a loathing, if you will, of the darkness and everything that's associated with it, even its evil deeds. See, people in Jesus' generation, because this is all here in the Gospel of John, almost all the scriptures, most of the scriptures I've shared with you tonight come from the Gospel of John that we'll get to again later. But I thought it important to underscore this life and this light. People in Jesus' generation, it comes to this, they did not want to accept the light. They didn't want to they didn't want to accept the light. Why? Preadventure it brought understanding and realization to their evil deeds they were practicing. Amen. They didn't they didn't want to love the light or come to the light because the light exposes things. The light reveals things. And they thought if we get close to the light, it's going to reveal and expose some evil deeds. And not only will that happen pre-eventual, we may be reproved or we may be rebuked because of the evil deeds. And so the Bible says it like this, that people love darkness basically because it was the cesspool or the pit for all their evil deeds and they were satisfied with their evil deeds. They were satisfied with their way of life. They were satisfied with living contrary to the Lord, to the law, to the Torah, to Scripture because people love darkness. This is the reason why. Because they can do whatever they want to do without any refusal, without any rebuke. We got to be careful today as the church of the living God not to fall in love with darkness because it's a blanket for us to do what we want, what suits us, what fits us, what makes us quote unquote happy. No, no, no. What you need to do whenever you start feeling like that, you need to walk in the light. You need to find the brightest. You need to, you need to be, if you will, exposed and shined on by Jesus Christ. Let him reveal those things that are out of step with him. Repent over them and get right with God. I don't want to become a lover of the dark. Darkness, because if I love the darkness, there's no way I can abide in the light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. See, the light, he says, started out there in verse number 19, John 3, 19. He said, this is the condemnation. This is the judgment that light is come into the world. You know what the writer, what gospel here, John is telling us. He's saying the light, I know this is hard. The light condemns. The light judges. Now watch this. That light and that life is Jesus Christ. That light and that life is the word. Here's the thing concerning the light. It doesn't, the light doesn't have to do anything to condemn. The light doesn't have to do anything to judge except exist. (laughs) Hallelujah. It don't have to do anything except exist. What I'm saying is as Jesus walked along in his public ministry in his life, he didn't have to open his mouth. He didn't have to point any fingers at anybody. His pure existence of God manifested in the flesh here upon the land, upon the earth. His pure existence made people uncomfortable and provoked attacks toward him because he was the light. And simply just being the light was bringing exposure and enlightenment and realization to some things that have been hid, if you will, in darkness, in deeds of darkness. His life alone, without a word being spoken, was calling dark deeds into question because light will always expose what's in the darkness. Always. 
Bible says in John 12, verse 35, look at this. Then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light with you. The reason being he knew of his hour that was coming of crucifix. Walk while ye have the light. Lest darkness come upon you. I've already made reference to that. Now look at this. For he that walketh, we've looked at that, tread all around to be occupied. He that walketh in darkness, look, knoweth not whether he goeth. He that walks, you say, Brother McGee, this is so elementary. It is. I, I, I agree that the thought pattern is, but if we could apply it to our real lives, uh, we might glean something here. In the darkness, a person does not know whether he goeth when you walk in that. So that means simply this, that the tragedy of darkness is this. You don't know where you're going in the darkness. Let that just sink in for a moment. You don't know where you are going in the darkness. There's a lot of people that think they know exactly what they're doing, exactly what they're, where they're going. They got this thing. They, they got life lassoed. They got their hands on the, the, the horns of the bull. They got this. All, they, they're in control. But, folks, according to the word, if you're walking in darkness, in reality, you don't know where you are going. You cannot see, properly see your way. You, for that matter, you cannot see the obstacles that are around you. Jesus said, if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth. If a man walk in the night, he stumbleth. Because you don't know where you're going. You don't know the obstacles that are around you. And I believe anybody just in the real natural world, any and every person that's ever stubbed their toe in the middle of the night. And for that matter, you're talking about even in, in, in a dark, familiar place that you've done that is going to be able to raise their hand and testify and tell us tonight, you know what, it's hard to gauge where things are in the dark. Hmm? Not only is it hard to gauge where things are, it's hard to gauge where I am as a person in relationship to other things. In the dark. Whenever I was a, whenever I was a kid, I had something that I liked to do. I don't know if anybody does this, but I did it when I was a kid. I love to grab um, my mother's mirror that she used to, to look into the mirror ahead of her that she would use to bounce back to the mirror that she'd hold in her hand to fix the back part of her hair. And so I'd take that mirror. It had a handle on it. But I'd take that mirror and I'd lay it on my hand with the mirror side facing the ceiling. And as I held it there, I would get my face just as close as I could to that mirror and so as I'm looking into the mirror just as close as I can, I'm seeing the ceiling above me. And I would go through the house, staring down into the mirror, walking, because it gave me the feeling as though I was walking on the ceiling. All right? And so as I was going around on the ceiling, you know, there were the lights that were on the ceiling. I had to watch and the door facings where it went from one room to the next that I had to watch. And so I was looking at the ceiling. So I would walk around our house, right? But my steps were determined by the ceiling and the door framings. My feet were on the floor. Sad thing. Too bad I couldn't walk on the ceiling in reality. But my feet were on the floor, but my eyes were on the ceiling. And I would do that, and I would just get a kick out of it, but I would trip over stuff, fall down. I just thought it just gave you a weird feeling. I don't know what it was, but anyway, I'd fall down, and I'd trip over stuff. Let me tell you something. Like Walking in darkness is, is real similar to doing my little mirror trick because we're attempting to walk in the realm, really, of the eternal, but our eyes are fixed on the temporal. And it's hard to walk in eternity when you're focused on the here and now. One doesn't translate well into the other. You don't know where you are going. You don't know what you are coming upon. Can I tell you today, folks, that I am wanting, I am striving, I desire to walk in the light today because I'm trying to get to a city where the Lamb is the light. I know where I'm going 
I don't want to stumble. I'm striving for, as the book of Revelation says, for that city where there is no need for a sun, no need for a moon. I want to go up yonder where the Bible says the glory of the Lord lightens that place where there is no night, no darkness. And here's the fact of the matter. If I want to walk in the light of that city, then I best walk in the light of who he is right now. Hallelujah. If I want to go where the in the city where the Lamb is the light, then I need to be walking in the light now. So my transition is from light to light. It's either from light to light or darkness to darkness. You cannot counter cross. Hallelujah. Hell oh, Jesus. Someone say glory out there in your homes tonight. Hallelujah. And so this word, this life, this light. Jesus Christ was. John moves on. He moves on talking about the light, from talking about the light to talking about someone who bore witness of that light. Yes, true, according to the third verse of our chapter, that the world was created through Jesus. But John denotes that Through John, which is the Baptist, or even such like witnesses, them being witnesses and bearing witness to light, that all men might believe in Jesus. The words were created through the word in Jesus. But people coming to believe in Jesus was going to be by the aid of such witnesses like John the Baptist. You'll note that many times throughout the Gospel of John that John just mentions John the Baptist as John. We don't really see in the Gospel of John that the writer ever refers to himself as John. And so since that's the case, uh, he's able to just mention John the Baptist as John since he mentions none other. Uh, The writer John of this Gospel, again, usually refers to himself as the beloved disciple or the one that the Lord loved. And so whenever he speaks of John here in the scripture again, it is John the Baptist. John the Baptist who was a witness of the light. Again, this first chapter has so many terms that, that, that John is going to emphasize over and over again. Witness is one of them. Uh, 14 times it's used as a noun. 33 times as a verb. And so there was a man sent from God, the scripture tells us, whose name is John. It emphasizes to us that this John was not, John the Baptist was not the light. He was not the life for that matter. But he came to bear witness of that light. And there's, it's important that, that the Bible says that, that John was not that light. And with good measure it does this. We see throughout the Gospel of John and some of the other Gospels for that matter. John is in that position and place. You know, he, he, he's six months older than Jesus. He comes six months before Jesus. He comes as the forerunner, the heralder of uh, the Lord, uh, of the Christ, prepare you the way, all these measures. He, he, the Bible, he was, he was one that preached repentance and remission of sins. He baptized uh, people into the baptism of repentance, okay? He speaks in places of Scripture that he was going to have to decrease and Christ was going to have to increase. And with good purpose, he does this because here's what we got to take in consideration. There is much carefulness in the Scripture, even here in John, of not exalting, if I can use that word, not exalting John the Baptist. And it's well-founded because... Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Testaments, we have these 400 years of what would would seemingly be a, a silence or 400 years of being no prophetic utterance or at least a minimal amount of prophetic utterance. And then enters John the Baptist into New Testament scripture doing what? Giving prophetic utterances. Prepare you the way of the Lord. And so they haven't had this for such a long time. And all of a sudden this man shows up, born Zacharias and Elizabeth, this man shows up and he's speaking prophetic things. It'd be very easy then to put a lot of stock and confidence in such a one when that has been silenced for years. And so it comes very, very uh, directly here in John that John the Baptist was not the light. John the Baptist was not the life, although he was very instrumental and be a forerunner 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we'll see later in the scripture that some people even mistaken John the Baptist for Christ. They asked him plainly, art thou the Christ? And he, of course, clearly denied and said that I am not the Christ. For that matter, the Bible teaches us that John the Baptist, he didn't do any miracle. But it does say this, but all the things that he spoke concerning Jesus Christ, they were true. He did no miracle, but everything that he spoke concerning Jesus Christ was true. Meaning this, he was a faithful witness. He gave good witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John the Baptist bears witness of the light, of the life, of this word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? So that men might believe. He is helping. He is a great tool and aid that John's focusing on. He says, because what John is doing is what the purpose of my gospel is about, that people would believe on the Lord and believing in his name that they would have life. And so he's being a witness, all right? And John, the the writer of the gospel, John the beloved, again, is leveraging all this again for his purpose in writing his gospel. Craig uh, Keener says it like this. He says, the word is the ultimate truth for all of human history, but is made known through witnesses. The word is is an ultimate profound truth, but it's made known through witnesses. Thank God for the light that came down from heaven. But thank God for the John the Baptists and others that we could listen to Scripture that bore witness to that light so that men and women and multitudes would believe on him and his name. All, I might say and underscore, all that receive the light of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ need to be light bearers. We're not the light, but we need to be lamps. We need to be light bearers. We need to witness to the light. The Bible says in verse number 12, we'll we'll look at this more in coming weeks, that as many as received him, as many as received the light, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. In the book of Acts, Acts 1 and 8, we're also told that they received power after the Holy Ghost was come upon them and they were to be witnesses unto Jesus. So what that tells me tonight is this. Our witness, our bearing witness to the light is very important. It's very vital. It's very essential that we witness to the light. Jesus, even in his high priestly prayer that we'll later, later, weeks from now, read of in John chapter number 17, as he's praying there, he's doing a lot of praying for his disciples and for those that he's going to leave in the earth. But the Bible says in one place in verse 20, that not only did he pray for his disciples, look at this now, but he prayed for them also, which shall believe on me, he said, through their word. He says, I'm praying for my disciples, but I'm praying on those that are going to believe on me because of their word. What? Because of their witness. Because of them bearing witness to the light, other people are going to believe. And so I'm going to pray for them as a result of that. Jesus knew that their witness, their word, their testimony, what they shared concerning the Lord would be very essential in people's belief in him. That's the reason why John bore witness to the light so that all men through him might Believe they're not believing in him, but because of his word, his testimony, his witness, they are believing in the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people witnessing people bearing witness to the light is a very vital, very vital to the purpose of the fourth gospel. For that matter, I believe I believe uh, that it is even vital to how the true light lights every man that comes into the world, because whenever I read that. Over the past few days in verse number seven, that, 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 that John bore witness to the light that all men through him might, might believe. And verse number nine that says, which light if every man, that was the true light, speaking of the Lord, which light if every man that cometh into the world. I ask myself the question, how in the world can that light light every man that cometh into the world? Amen. But I believe our witnessing is a means and way 
that the light does reach each and every individual. Think with me for a moment. In, in, in the culture in which the light come, in the culture of the Greeks and the Romans, uh, of polytheism and polytheistic ways of a multitude of gods, it was important for John to denote the true light, the genuine light, uh, the true light among quote-unquote lights or the true light among other gods that the nations of the Romans and the, and the Greeks uh, were littered with. But he said, that light's going to reach every man. Why? Because people are bearing witness of the light. And we see that so in the New Testament Scripture. Thank God for people like Peter and Paul who both went beyond the Jewish sector and went into the Gentile sector. It got unto other individuals because they bore witness to the light. Thank goodness, if you will, even for uh, the Apostle Paul there in the ending of his life, reaching all the way to Rome and having the ability because of being incarcerated to be able to speak of people of high uh, uh, offices and high positions. Amen. And because of him bearing witness of the light, you know, there's people like Felix and there's people like Agrippa that are hearing about the light. Thank God for Philip and Peter and John in Acts chapter number eight, where the great revival of Samaria broke out. There is that message before Jesus ever ascended to go in all to, into all the world. Why? Because he wanted people to be bear, bearing witness of him, the light. Why? So that it could light, if you will, every man. It could light every man that would come into the world. Notice with me, and I, I'll try not to hold you here much longer, but you'll notice in John chapter number four that Jesus went to the well in Samaria, right? He must needs go through Samaria. He goes to the well of Samaria. He has this great conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, right? Tries to offer her not water from a well, but living water himself. The Bible tells us in the closure, in the ending of that story, that Jesus stayed two extra days in Samaria because the people of Samaria wanted him to stay. And the reason why the people of Samaria wanted Jesus to stay is because that one encounter with the woman at the well of Samaria, she went back to her town and she told her people what Jesus was saying. She told her people, he told me all that I ever did. She, what was she doing? She was bearing witness. She was being a John the Baptist, if you will, of her generation. She was bearing witness to the light. And see, this is what light does. It's what light did for her. Jesus at the well, what happens? You have, you have five husbands and one you're with now. It's not your husband. It exposes. There'll come a day that neither in this mountain will you worship. You know not what you worship. What's it doing? It's exposing. And so the light knows and the light exposes. But look what the Bible says in John 4 and verse 41 and 42. And many more believed, because the Samaritans heard about it from the lady at the well. He's staying two extra days. And many more believed because of his own word. Huh? She bore witness to the light. They got more interested, engaged by the light himself. And because of his own word, many more believed. In verse 42, the Bible says, And said unto the woman, Now we believe. This is what the reports the Samaritans are back to the original woman at the well. Now we believe. Not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They said, we're thank you. But how did they even know about him to begin with? Because she bore witness to the light. And that led them to a relationship, a fellowship, a communion with him. Amen. That led to their own personal belief. What's happening? The world, men, women were coming to be enlightened in the world because of the witnesses because of those that are testifying and bearing witness to the light. They said, no, no, that this indeed, they said, Christ, that the Christ, the Christ, the Savior of the world. I'll close with this tonight. How can the true light then light every man that comes into the world? I believe these ladies of Samaria kind of summed it up for us. Because through the Lord, they learned this. When we learn, when they learn, that Jesus is the Savior of the world, then there's an understanding that comes very quickly, and that is this. If Jesus is the Savior of the world, then we understand the world must be in need of a Savior. Hallelujah. 
If Jesus is the Savior, I'm going to bear witness to the life. Why? Because if I can get them to understand that he's the Savior of the world, perhaps they'll grasp that then the world must be in need of a Savior. And that includes them. It is the word that was in the beginning, both the life and the light. And John says, I'm going to come alongside him and I'm going to bear witness to him. Why? So that people might believe and their lives might be in lightened hallelujah 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 thank the lord we're going to pray here this evening amen before we leave here tonight we're going to ask the lord to touch our hearts and our souls and take this word and allow it to germinate in in our souls and in our spirits and flourish into something uh, productive and something beautiful hallelujah the word life and light Amen. We'll be here again, of course, this coming uh, Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night. There's plenty of things that you can keep track of throughout the week as well online. And so don't forget those matters as well. Hallelujah. Amen. But I want you to be empowered this week. You say, Brother McGee, I'm isolated in quarantine. How in the world can I be a light? You can. You can even from the, uh, the, the safety and the walls of your own home be a, be a light. Use, use your social media. Use what you can for the purpose of shining the light so that every man, so that every man can witness the true light. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about being mean or unkind or anything of that nature, but sometimes just turning the light on brings enough exposure. Hallelujah. Be the light of the world. Be the light of the world. Father, I come to you tonight. I'm grateful today, Lord, for your power, for your spirit. I'm thankful, Lord, for your word. I pray, oh, Lord Jesus, today, God, let that word, Lord, find a place, Lord, of settling in our hearts and our minds. Help us, oh, Lord Jesus, to think upon it, Lord, to consider it, Lord, throughout the rest of this week of you being the life and the light and us helping, Lord, to bear witness to that light even in our generation. Lord, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peters and Phillips of that day, Lord, are tremendous, but they are dead and gone. We need an, an Apostle Paul and a Philip and a Samaritan woman in our day, God, that will tell of the things of the Lord to those that we come in contact with. I pray, O oh Lord, be with your people. Continue to give them strength, give them health in their bodies, soundness of mind. Help them, O oh Lord Jesus, not to walk in darkness, tread around and be occupied with the darkness, but God, walk in the light as you are the light and we'll have fellowship one with the other. In the lovely name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being again uh, here with us on this Wednesday night. And we will see you personally here on Sunday. God bless you in Jesus' name.